Hi, my name is uh, Robert Boynton. I run the literary reportage concentration here at the Arthur L. Carter Journalism Institute at New York University. Uh, welcome to our third and final for this uh, semester uh, uh, program on audio reportage. Uh, it's been a really interesting experiment to have these conversations and we're hoping to continue to do them uh, in the uh, fall and the spring of next year. And so please also contact us if you have suggestions of uh, programs or uh, podcasters or radio people you want to discuss uh, or have discussions with. Uh, we're always happy to uh, have these kinds of events, uh, especially in this sort of this mediated world. It's very nice to get together and actually have people uh, gather around face to face and, and talk about uh, this art form and uh, this form of journalism. Tonight we have a, a terrific program. Uh, we have uh, Alice Koppelman and Whitney Jones of the famed Pitch uh, podcast, about to embark on its third season, well underway, I'm sure. And uh, we have uh, Alex Brokaw, who's a, a graduate student in the literary reportage concentration, who is going to be doing the interview. So take it away. As Rob said, we have been very, very lucky to have some incredibly talented producers on this stage over the course of the spring. And the tradition continues with Whitney Jones and Alex Kappelman. Uh, they are the co-producers of Pitch, a narrative podcast about music. They make intimate stories that get to the heart of why we listen to music, how we experience it, and what we're actually hearing when we hit play. And if you're anything like me, and you've been listening to Pitch since you launched it was about 14 months ago, right? Uh, you will understand why critics have called it everything from incredibly well-produced to one of the most exciting mu music-related podcasts to a work of art. And to be fair, that last pull quote was not from a critic. It was from Roman Mars, but I couldn't leave it out. Uh, Alex Kappelman is a New York City native and, and an audio producer and musician who's produced content for the likes of WNYC, KCRW, and Gimlet, and others. Whitney Jones hails from Mon Monmouth, Oregon, and is a production manager for the Moth Radio, Pot Radio Hour and Podcast. I'm sorry, is the production manager or just production manager. Um, for the Moth Radio Hour podcast and has produced stories for NPR, CBC, and numerous local public stations. Before we get to know a little bit more about these guys, I'm going to play the introduction from an episode of theirs called Somewhere in My Memory, just so we can all get in the pitch mood. <laughs> Pitch is our perception of frequency. All that note sound. Pitch is... It seems cheesy to say that music is all around us, but it really is. You can't go into a coffee shop or a bar or a restaurant without hearing a song. I can barely ride the subway without hearing music blaring from the earbuds of the guy sitting next to me. But music can also be around us in less obvious ways, as I discovered over the past year. Because all that it takes to get a song stuck in my head is one simple tone. That's the sound of the default text notification on the iPhone 5S and the new iPhone 6. It's called Note. And for a lot of people, it's the sound of someone trying to get their attention. But for me, it's the sound of something totally different. We come on in this loop, John. This is the Beach Boys version of Sloop John B. It was on their great album, Pet Sounds. And the song means a lot to me. I used to sing it as a kid at summer camp all the time in these big group sing-alongs. So when I heard the Beach Boys version of Sloop John B, I immediately took to it. Now, I don't have a newer... There are a lot of music podcasts out there, and I, I chose this clip in particular because it's a great example of why pitch is so new, unique. You, you explore parts of our world that music is involved in in some aspect, uh, at a distance at some points, very, very close in at some points. We can come back to talk about this particular episode, but I'd love to start t uh, by hearing how you two met and began developing your idea for pitch. Sure. Uh, I guess it was, it would have been 2013, 
there was a couple of different radio conferences that happened here in the city, um, and Alex and I both ended up at them. I didn't know who he was. He didn't know who I was. I guess... No, yeah. I, I knew who you were. I was a, a big fan of you, uh, actually. <laughs> uh, I, I just kept seeing this guy at, uh, at these radio conferences. We ended up sitting next to each other at a couple different sessions and just started talking. It was quickly apparent that we both liked music and we both liked radio, and we were like, hey, we should... We should get together and talk about music and radio at some point. And so we actually went to this uh, place called Milady's, uh, which is in Soho. It, it, it recently closed down. It's like this really seedy, uh, <laughs> like dive bar. And uh, yeah, we, we got together, and uh, I guess I guess the magic happened. And you had both been radio producers before this, right? I know you're a musician and had been working as a musician, but had you been producing for radio? <laughs> Working as a musician is kind of a strong, well. <laughs> a strong term, but I was, I was gigging, yeah. yeah uh, right. um, and I had been, so Whitney actually had a lot more experience than I did. I, uh, ha I had only started working in radio that previous January, uh, so I really had like nine months of experience. I was interning at Soundcheck on WNYC, um, which is a, a, a great music show. Um, and then I was working there for a little bit, and I worked at The Takeaway for a little bit, and um, The Brian Lair Show, I was kind of doing this thing called per dieming, which is just being like a temp, essentially, there. Uh, and that's when I ran into Whitney. Yeah, I, I'd started, I had no background in media at all. I went to the Transom Story Workshop in fall of 2011. It was the first one they did. Uh, I just thought I needed to drive across the country and quit everything and, and make radio, and so that's essentially what I did. Um, and then I'd been, I'd been freelancing and interning for basically two years by that point. And as you began developing the concept for Pitch, was it there a sense of you saw a missing piece in the marketplace that you wanted to fill with, with your concept? Uh, or did you have a pile of story ideas that you formed into a concept? I think it was kind of a bit of both. I, I mean, personally, I... I listen to a lot of radio. I like radio. There were things like This American Life, 99% Visible, and uh, I guess Planet Money, all these, Planet Money and 99% Visible in particular took specific topics and did like deep dives into these, into these things. And as a music fan, I wanted that for music and didn't see anybody really doing it other than like, I, I guess on occasion you, you'd get it in another show, but not a, a specific show that's focused on music and that sort of that form of narrative storytelling. And so that was definitely a part of it, yeah. Yeah, no, I was, I was going to say, um, I mean, there are lots of music outlets, like music journalism is obviously, mm -hmm. there's a million places out there. Um, and a lot of people do it really, really well. And we, like when you said, we wanted to kind of add that like narrative storytelling, the highly produced, um, these, you know, narrative stories mm -hmm. um, that kind of explore music in a way that uh, podcasting and public radio can take advantage of because it's in sound. Right. Um, and, and we wanted to do something with that. Mm. Yeah. Do, I, do you guys consider yourselves music journalists? Or, or I, I mean, I, I, I see it more as you, you telling stories that happen to d deal in the world of music, but it, it seems separate from something that's specifically about music. It's not music criticism. You're not you're talking about an emotional side of music that maybe I haven't seen in in music journalism, although I, I haven't read a ton of it. So, journalism is a tricky word, and to people who like actually go to school for it, I feel bad like just <laughs> claiming the title myself because I I didn't go to school for that. Um, even like when I was when I was freelancing and doing pieces that were just specifically straight up reported pieces for. Uh, like I did a, I did a political piece for CBC during the last election, mm -hmm. and it was just basically straightforward news. And like, I I don't know that I considered myself a journalist by doing that piece or by doing a couple other pieces. Uh, again, out of deference to friends who are actually journalists and, and trained in that. Uh, so <laughs> music journalism <laughs> is like, uh, music. I, I don't know what to call it. Music person who likes music and likes writing and likes right. producing stuff. Like that's tough to put on a business card, but. I mean, I, I guess we probably are music journalists, honestly, because music journalism encompasses a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, does the person who wrote the review 
uh, on Pitchfork, you know, for that Jet album where he just posted, uh, <laughs> it's it's this cl- like classic terrible review of some guy post. It, it's it's just a YouTube video of a monkey peeing in his own mouth, and that's the entire review because <laughs> the guy hated the album so much. Um, so he's a music journalist. Yeah. I don't know how journalistic that is, but I mean, to his point, that album. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, but yeah, so I think music journalism encompasses a lot, and, and we're in somewhere in between, you know, a monkey peeing in your own mouth, and I don't know, whatever, like... <laughs> so, so, yeah, I, I, was, I, I was going to ask you, how would you classify the types of stories that, that you report, and I think you just told us that it's between a monkey <laughs> pissing in his own mouth, and, and yeah. I, I, I think for the first, the first... I mean, I, I think everything we've done so far has just sort of been like... I am interested in that idea over there. Or I, there's something to this that appeals to me, and now we have a platform that we can kind of do whatever we want with. Mm. And so I'm going to go explore that for the next month and then produce a story about it at the end of that. Mm. So you, you tend to find your, story, your, your stories are driven out of self-interest uh, or, or your interest in, in a certain thing, peculiar little things that... that, that come up as they do. You're not out there looking for specific kinds of stories. You, you're, I, I mean, what, I'm, I'm thinking of, of uh, the beginning of the Clear Mountain Pause episode, which uh-huh. is the first episode of season one, and this is something that you had been ruminating on for some time, right? Yeah, I talk about that uh, actually in the introduction to the, yeah. the piece, that this is a thing that while I was interning, I was also working as a parking lot attendant. And I was sitting there during the summer reading uh, a visit from the Goon Squad, Mm -hmm. uh, Jenna Freakin's book. And there's this chapter that literally I was just flipping through. And then there's the chapter where it's a PowerPoint presentation. You have to turn the book sideways. And like to say I was a parking attendant, it was a parking lot with seven spaces in it. And so (laughs) I, I would park those seven spaces for the day. And then I would sit there for the next five hours and read, essentially. And I, I got to this to this chapter and she's talking about rock and roll pauses and it bothered me and not bothered isn't the right word it, it stuck in my mind in a bothersome way and like over the, literally like a year and a half that sort of sat there and then I sort of looked into it well like where did this come from where did she get this idea and when that sort of started unraveling a little bit like I, I felt like that was a story I wanted to do and then right around that same time I met Alex and suddenly had a, a place, a, a reason to do the story. Do you guys have favorite episodes that, that come to mind out of your, is it 14 episodes now that you've produced? Yeah. Um, I, I think for me, probably my favorite episode uh, that I produced at least um, is called Somewhere in My Memory. Mm-hmm. Um, it came out of, how, how did you just phrase it? Like it, it, it bothered you in a way that you had to like get it out? Yeah, there was this, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the episode is predicated on the fact that, like, uh, the, I, oh, you, you just listened to it. You just played um, it, yeah. Yeah, and that, so that, I basically had just heard that over and over and over again, everywhere I went, and every single time it played, I was, I was just getting the Beach Boys song stuck in my head, and it was, like, torturing me. It was, like, really, really annoying, uh, and uh, I, I, like, it basically, I was just driven to the point of being like, am I, the, am I crazy? Like, am I the only person doing it? And I literally just went out and just tried to f- figure out if I was alone mm. and figure out why it was happening and, and is this guy who designed the thing trying to, I don't know, it's, is he trying to... with th- your head. Yeah, he's trying yeah. to screw <laughs> with my head, yeah. Um, and so, I don't know, it, it, was, it, it was, it's probably my favorite because uh, it was cathartic in that way, but also because it allowed me to, to play with sound and... Uh, a, a fun way um, that I think turned out really well. Yeah. So, do you? I, yeah, I think there are parts of every single episode that I am enthusiastic about, and if if that wasn't the case, I don't know that I would have done the episode. Uh, the Clear Mountain Pause, obviously, because it had been sitting with me for so long, to finally get that out and, and have it out in the world, that's that's one of my favorite ones I've done. I think karaoke, just the fact that I got to sing Whitney Houston's Greatest Love of All and put that out there into the world like i'm pretty proud of that yeah <laughs> yeah that was that was fun to record as well what are some of the more challenging episodes that you guys have worked on 
Uh, I think for me, the most challenging one was um, this one called Voice, uh, which focuses on a, a transgender man uh, and uh, essentially his transition. And he's a, he's a singer. And so how, like when you start taking testosterone, not all transgender people take testosterone, um, but you can, if you elect to do it, it'll like when you start doing it, it lowers your lowers your voice forever. So uh, the singer, uh, you know, like if it's a female singer, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the the voice just completely changes. And I, I, I was interested in, in grappling with that. But that started off as a totally different piece of m like me myself, just trying to see what would happen if I didn't sing for a week because I just sing all the time, like right. everywhere. Like in the shower, like just everywhere I go, to the annoyance of everybody around me, uh, and uh, and I just failed. Like it didn't turn up anything interesting, and we had to postpone the episode by a week. Uh, and so I had to. I mean, like it. It was hard in one sense because uh, I only had a week to do it, but also, but but it was also hard because I don't know. I feel like the stakes were were much higher because it was born out of failure, and I had to like. <laughs> And, you know. I, I love you, you posted an episode in between when you had <clears throat> failed at not failed but were no, failed failed failed, failed. failed. Yeah. well failed you had failed terribly at at, uh, <laughs> at producing at, at producing this episode and and was that a decision that you thought about in, in terms of connecting with your audience and and telling your audience that you were something was not going to come out you were not delivering on schedule is was that a decision that came immediately or yeah, I think I think since the since we started producing the show, we've I mean we don't get paid, we don't have like a, a perch, we don't have anyone like sponsoring us mm -hmm. or anything like that. Um, but since the beginning of of the show, we've talked about the show as if it were being produced, you know, for WNYC or for NPR, right. for Radiotopia or, or whatever, like and and holding it to the highest possible standards that we can. Mm -hmm. um, and part of that was. You know, I was freaking out that like people are expecting something every two weeks, mm -hmm. and uh, and I didn't want to let people down. You know, I didn't want to or, or like shatter the illusion that we're just like we're just two schmucks like you know making this out of our apartments. Right. Um, right. You might have just shattered it, <laughs> <laughs> but no one say anything. All right. Right. So I so I figured the best way, and I had also been reading like I've been like I don't know following Melody Kramer for a while, who is. Uh, this woman who is a social media person uh, at from uh, Fresh Air and then NPR, and she's really big into transparency. Mm -hmm. So all that kind of stuff was kind of melding together. And I was like, why don't we just tell people that I fucked up and, mm -hmm. you know, say like, I'll be back next week. Don't worry. What what are what are parts of of, of producing episodes and doing what you do that that you dislike most about the process? We'll get to the like That's after. Well, I, I mean, I, I don't know if I dislike it necessarily, but I always have trouble like starting, like sending the first email is always the hardest thing for me. Mm -hmm. I don't know, it's just like some hump, uh, I don't know why, but I guess I'm maybe scared that it's not going to work or something, and, and so maybe I just delay it as much as I possibly can uh, to Whitney. Yeah, I, and I, I think it's that same, that same thing, sending the first email and like, yeah, I, I don't know what it is. I, I think I'm naturally a little bit shyer than Alex's. Um, not I think I am naturally <laughs> shyer than Alex's. And, uh, and approaching people and saying, can I take an hour of your time? <laughs> can, I, can I impose on your life in that way? Is always a little bit strange for me. Uh, but like once, once I hear back from them and they're like, yes, I'll meet with you. Like from that point on, like I love every, every bit of, doing pitch like even even when Alec well, even when it's like midnight one in the morning and, and Alex is like hey where's the script you told me you were gonna have it to me by today and I'm like I will get it to you it's coming like th those aren't those aren't the happiest times and they're they're stressful but I love like every second of that and so how so you bring up sending him the script how do you two collaborate on a day-to-day -day, uh, on producing podcasts do each host individual episodes but I imagine the other one who's not hosting is very active behind the scenes. It's, it's changed, actually, a lot. Uh, the first four episodes, we weren't quite sure how to approach that. It was just Alex and I, um, and like the first few episodes were both, were both kind of co-hosting, and we bounced back and forth a lot in sort of a Radiolab-type fashion. Um, and after a while, like 
after those first couple, it just felt like we were standing in for bad writing to, to a certain extent. Like, instead of just writing the narration well, we were like, well, what do you think about this, Alex? Let me, let me <laughs> soft pitch this ball for you so you can, you can hit it. Um, and I, I think there was a decision made halfway through the first season that, like, if the other person doesn't need to be there, they can just, like, go away and it's fine. They'll be back next week and, and they'll narrate the next episode. Um, and sort of moving through the second season, we, we edit for each other. Like, I'll send a script to Alex. Alex will edit it. It starts even before that when we're pitching stories. It's been like, what do you think of this? No. Uh, what do you think of this? Well, that works here. What about this piece over here? Um, so it's very collaborative. And then just recently we've added, um, we've added additional people to the, the pitch team, I guess. And so there's been more voices bouncing things around and we've actually had to set, because there's more people in the room, we've had to set an actual like production schedule. Like this is how we're gonna move through these. This is who's gonna be responsible for what at which point. And it's much more uh, formalized, but also uh, freeing in a way where like, yeah, I, I would just say more, more freeing in a, in a way. And just to elaborate on that, like we have a, a you know a weekly call, um, and and the two people, by the way, are one of them is Rachel Hammerman, who's who's here. Uh, she's a communications consultant, and uh, she did the PR campaign for Serial. Uh, huh. And I don't know if you've ever heard of it. Uh, yeah. uh, and uh, the other person is Ellen Mayer, uh, who is this. She just graduated from college. Mm -hmm. She's really smart, really knows like an unbelievable amount about music, and is just really incisive. She's. Like, it's been unbelievable how she can just, like, walk. She just walked in and was just, like, just an unbelievable editor. And, and Rachel has been amazing at just kind of helping us strategize and, you know, editorially and, you know, from a communications perspective. Um, yeah, it's, it's been, it, I, I think I've enjoyed, it's a lot more work, I think, but I think the product is going to be a lot better. Uh, and it's, I, I enjoy it a lot more, I think. There's, there's a quality to the way you two tell stories, a, a curiosity, a exploratory nature that's reminiscent of, of uh, This American Life and Radiolab and their style. Uh, you're specifically, obviously, narrowed down to music. Are there shows or specific producers you two recognize, maybe these are them, maybe others, as having influenced your style? Yeah, uh, definitely. I mean, I mean, you. I mean, those are probably the two biggest for right. me. Um, I mean, This American Life definitely reigns supreme. I think always. Um, Radio Lab also is, is amazing. Um, uh, Planet Money is great. When I was when I first started uh, when I first started uh, uh, like narrating pieces, I would say things exactly like Zoe Chase would say. <laughs> them. It was really weird. Uh, uh, in her in, in her accent as well, or. <laughs> uh, I, I, even if I tried, I could not replicate yeah. <laughs> that accent. Um, uh, who else? I mean, more and more it's becoming stuff like, I, I've been really into Andrea Salenzi recently, uh, YOY. She's able to do this like really interesting mishmash of like radio fiction and two-way interviews, but also these reported pieces and then like Benjamin Walker, like, you know, essays. Right. Uh, and she somehow makes it work and she's really great at it. The heart uh, is also an amazing thing. Like I, I, every time I listen to the heart, I like feel like real feelings. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, that's something that I really want to uh, attain with pitch as well. I think my influence is I, for some reason I've been attracted to like obscure, like kind of pointless ideas. I, I, I majored in classics. I studied ancient Greek and Latin. <laughs> Like, that academic background is, is part of who I am in, in my approach to music stories. And then there's just, like, stuff that, like, producers that I look up to. Uh, there's a, a reporter, she used to be a foreign correspondent for NPR, Kelly McEvers. Um, producer Sean Cole. People who I hear their work and I'm like, whoa, you can do that in a piece. And, like, we're obviously not NPR news. Uh, and so we don't have... Like, there's really nothing we can't do in a pitch story at this point. But, like, to hear people go on the air and, and be on podcasts doing stuff in a, in a style that's very interesting to me. Um, like, I, I don't know. I, I always hear, in, in Sean's stories, I always hear him, like, on the tape responding to, to the person he's interviewing. And, like, I, I was taught that when, like, 
my, my, my training when I started doing radio was like, you ask the question, and then you wait for the response, and you nod your head. And you, go, mm -hmm. <laughs> and you don't hear yourself on the microphone. And suddenly, I'm, I'm hearing people doing that, or, or just Sean with his amazing laugh, just like cutting through the entire piece. And I was like, oh, you can actually be a human in an interview. That's cool. Maybe I'll try that sometime. And so like, I, I feel like my enthusiasm for, for strange, odd, maybe obscure topics mixed with like the producers that I really enjoy is sort of how I've approached pieces to this point. And actually, Sean, for me too, like before I, I was really acquainted with Sean's work, I was kind of scared about putting myself as the main character in a story, right. which is laughable now because I'm the main character in all of my stories. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and he kind of changed everything for me. He's, he's just amazing at doing that. So thinking about the style of, of your show uh, and, and having gone back and, and, and re-listened to all of them on Sunday in a, in a marathon listening session, Many of your episodes take the, the form of these, these audio personal essays. And you, you have a thesis, you're going to go out into the world and prove this thesis, uh, and, and I'm going to play a clip from your, your third episode. And uh, this is reported by Whitney, and it's called Rock the Long Box. To be provocative right from the start, I'm going to make this claim right here. I think the most politically important album of all time is R.E.M.'s Out of Time. You're not talking about like Bob Dylan, you know, like the times they were changing. You're not talking about Sam Cooke, the change is going to come. Like you're not talking about civil rights. You're not talking about like U2. Why? I put this album up against all of those. And, and here's the thing, not just the album, but the packaging from this album made voter registration accessible for hundreds of millions of voters in the United States. This isn't one of those, oh, it's a soundtrack to a generation, and that soundtrack indirectly influences uh, the culture, and in turn, that, no. We're talking an album, a bill being passed in Congress, and a concrete law. Wait, an album, a bill being passed in Congress, and a concrete law? Let's go back to 1985. The pop charts are full. This is the dual hosting that I'm yeah, talking about that right. we got rid of like, right after that episode came out. I haven't heard that since last year. It's really, it's, it was really weird to hear. <laughs> I'm glad we changed that style. There, there's a different version of it that went out at 99% Invisible that that's not in. And I hadn't heard this version of it in, in quite a while. So h how important it, it is this personal element, this personal search for you guys in your storytelling? Uh... Well, I don't know if it's necessarily a, like, you use the term personal essay. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's necessarily, like, this thing that's inside me that I have to get out. Mm -hmm. It's more like we're, and correct me if I'm wrong, Whitney, for, or at least for me, like, it's, it's, we have an idea that we want to pursue. And we come at it from a storytelling perspective. And one of the things with story that you need is a character. And, uh... It, you know, you can either go out and you know spend a lot of time trying to find a great character to follow that has some sort of story arc, or you can just be like, I'm the main character, and the story arc is I go on a journey to find out what happens, and that's a lot easier. <laughs> right. It also, I mean, it doesn't work all the time, but like if you're personally invested in a topic, and I, I think the the idea stories that we've done, we've pursued specifically because we are like invested in it and we're interested in it. Um, but yeah, like idea stories are hard to do narrative stories about and not just have it be like, so here's this idea and I'm going to talk boringly about it for the next 15 minutes. Like you have to have some sort of a beginning, middle and end and ideas don't necessarily lend themselves to that form that easily. Mm. Right. And because I guess because they do mean something to us, like it sets the stakes for, you know, being able to listen, like why, why is it even important? Right. Why should the listener even care if it's just someone just, I don't know, spewing some whatever about an idea? As, as far as having a thesis and sort of moving through it, though, like, I think that that's another way we approach these idea stories as like beginning, middle, and end. It's not necessarily like following the narrative of this character through the, through the story, but like here's the argument... I mean, it's just like basic essay writing. Right. Right? Like here, here's the argument. 
here's supporting evidence A, B, C, here's the conclusion. Like it's, it's very simple structurally, but uh, for these idea type stories, it, it's, I, I think that's one way that we've approached it. So, and I'm thinking about uh, the, the episode on backtracking, which would, I do want to play a clip from, uh, but, but are you telling me that you weren't really mad at that Vampire Weekend show about the, about the, uh, the backtracking? No, I was furious. I was really disappointed. It was because this was a band who I thought was really amazing, and I held them in really high regard, and they shattered the fourth wall for me. And you'll, I, I guess you'll, I don't, I don't want to. We're not going to, we're not going to play that part of the, the clip. If you could explain maybe the, sure. the beginning sure. of that. Sure. So um, there's like a kind of open secret in, uh, in the music business that like uh, live bands, uh, when they play live, sometimes use this thing called a backing track, which is just like a pre recorded track that they hit play on and then they play over it. It's different from lip syncing. You know, it's, it's not like Millie Vanilli. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, it's your your it's like enhancing uh what you have going live and so i came at that with the i with you know with the state of mind that like it's cheating uh and when i heard vampire weekend doing it this is a band that i really loved and i saw them live and i kind of was like wait wait wait, wait where's that fifth part coming from like when i saw that i was i was kind of like just like flabbergasted and really disappointed in them i thought morally that they were they were just doing something totally immoral <laughs> and that's why i was disappointed about right. it right Right. So, I, I want to play a, a clip from from the end of this episode when you were talking to a a Columbia University uh, PhD who who's a, a sociology professor. Uh, and just to to set this clip up, you've you've kind of gone out. You've had this experience with uh, at the Vampire Weekend concert, and you've gone out to explore your your gripe. With, with backtracking and, and, and you know, should it be acceptable? Uh, and, and you propose a premise to her and she takes issue with, with it and uh, I just, okay. <laughs> we have this idea of the way that things should be and then there's, we know the way that things are. That's Jennifer Lena. She's a sociology professor at Columbia who studies music. And we often ask or expect that the bands that we care about, the acts that we care about, the art that we care about, um, do better than the way things are and try to approach the way things should be. But I think every time we blame individual performers for acting rational within the system that we have, we're kind of missing the structural point. But that's, you, you could argue that like, if you play live and you play with a backing track, people are going to see you live and they expect that you're a good live band. Like the majority of people will go to a show and they'll have no idea that their backing track's there. Um, do you think it's important that bands display the computer on the line, like guitar, singer, computer, <laughs> or, you know, like what happens if it's less, like how important is, you know, you, you know what I'm trying to ask? Yeah, I do. Uh, um, so I think there's a danger in the way that you frame the question of me agreeing with you that the way that you see the world is the way that everybody sees the world. That was actually sort of your premise of your question. And I didn't want to interrupt you to object. Not everybody expects the same things when they go to a live show. And um, that's actually exactly the character of music communities is because everybody has a slightly different access point, meaning some people have liked the music for a while, others less so. Some heard it first in Detroit, others didn't. You know, because everybody has generated um, their own expectations of the style, not everybody at the same show has the same set of expectations of what counts as authentic on the stage. All right, that's true, but I have my own expectations of style. I mean, that's, that's why I'm talking about this. When I go to a show, I want an authentic live experience. And when I think of authentic, I think about humans playing instruments. They could make mistakes. They could fail so miserably in front of so many people, but they succeed. Or maybe they do fail every once in a while. But that's the price that you pay for seeing what heights they can reach. And, and you're... So th the reason that I wanted to play this clip, and, and you, you go on to, to um, defend your position on this, and then you go on to admit, okay, you know, well, maybe I'm a bit of a music snob sometime, which whatever, we're all snobs about something, right? Uh, and it, it's really, it's, what struck me about this is, is your willingness to make yourself vulnerable as, as the reporter of the story. 
uh, and and it ultimately it's it's what helps lead to the resolution of the story. It's it's very important in the story. Do you remember how how you felt when when that was happening in in in, in real time? Yeah, totally. That was actually the first interview I ever did for a reported piece. Really? I, yeah, I had a podcast like a like a two way interview podcast with musicians. Mm. Uh, for a blog that I used to write for called Buzz Chips, mm. uh, and but but this was the first thing that I did at all for for a pitch and the first reported thing I ever did, uh, and I was just super nervous throughout that entire interview. Mm. I mean, you could hear <laughs> me stumbling when asking her a question, um, but I mean, honestly, like this, I, I, that wasn't in the first the the finalized piece that I sent Whitney. That wasn't in, mm. and Whitney. I guess I guess you heard. I was perfectly willing to make Alex vulnerable for the sake of the piece, <laughs> which is which I think works a lot better than what we had before. I mean, yeah, uh, the the story behind this piece is that Alex Alex had it most of the way done, and then he got accepted to the Transom Story Workshop and, and left and and sent me the piece to basically finish and and put right, out. Sorry about that. No, no, it's fine. It's it's just it's it's what happened. And so I, I'm, I'm listening to Alex's, uh, to Alex's cut of this piece, and we got to this part, and it, it cut just before this started, and it came in just after the, the exchange between, um, between Alex and, and Dr. Lena, and it felt like something was just missing from there, and so I just, in the session, just moved it out, moved it out, moved it out, and kept listening and going back like five, six, seven minutes, and I, I got to this point and was just like, that... That's an amazing piece of tape. I love that exchange. And I feel like that moment, I feel like, is a really important, uh, is really important for, for where the series was going and, and what the show has become since then. Uh, from the standpoint that, like, Alex and I are, are both male, we're both white, we are both late 20s, early 30s. And that is a very specific perspective. And in this moment, the voice of authority shifts from host and producer to somebody who is not the host or producer. And to the degree that we can shake up who the, sometimes we are not even asking the right questions. I, and I think it's important for us to, to point that out and to, to have that in this piece, I think sort of sets that tone for the rest of what pitch is that we are enthusiastic about music and we're going out and asking questions about music, but sometimes we're not asking the right questions and there's other people with different perspectives than ours, different experience than ours that bring important, important points to the discussion and should be looked to as the authority in some cases instead of our voice. Do you think audio lends to the ability to do that? I know you guys don't have practice in, in print or, or, or video, but, but do you think there's a certain freedom with audio that, that allows for that? I think it captures exchanges like this one way better than you could do in print, uh, where it was like, uh, Dr. Elena said, da 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 da. Alex asked the question. Awkwardly. Like, it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be that, but like, right. just reading that exchange, I mean, I've read the transcript of that, and it doesn't do the same thing as their exchange in audio. I guess, I guess you could do it in video too, but like who wants to watch people interviewing people back and forth? I guess Well, <laughs> I hope someone. I hope so, yeah, sure. <laughs> Please. Hi. <laughs> uh, I, I, and I agree with you is, is for me, that, that is the defining moment in your show. And it, it, it's, it's telling me as a listener what the future of this show is going to be like. It sets the tone for the show. I know you put it at the end of the first season, which I, I think is, is the right place for you to end on. Um, I, I think that the sense that, that, that you guys have a limited perspective and you were exploring new perspectives and, and pushing out into the world is, is one of the reasons why Pitch has been so well received. And, and speaking of of the second season, Whitney, I, there there are different kinds of episodes that that you produce. There's there's these person personally driven episodes or 
you're using your your person. It's it's a it's a lie. It's fake. But no, um, like like the Clear Mountain episode where it really comes from you, and 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 like the your the um, backtracking episode which really comes from from your gripe. Uh, then you have episodes like the the Kristen. Melody episode, which which is a fantastic episode. Uh, Kristen Melody is is an actress and a singer, and she was in Once. Um, and you guide her through telling her story. Um, and then you have episodes again, like the karaoke karaoke episode, which which you know came from your personal interest in in this certain thing or subject. Is there a kind of episode you prefer to produce? Is you know what what is the difference in? Could you maybe explain the difference yeah, between producing yeah. both types? I mean, I, I like I like the variety of being able to do a, a a piece like the the piano player episode. I mean, that that came from very much a similar idea of as as the other episodes in that season. It was I, I was interested in the idea of uh, people who play musicians on stage or in or, or on film who are not themselves musicians uh do they just I, I i was fascinated by that do they just learn this thing do they just learn one song do they actually learn how to play what sort of timetable are we talking about and then um i i met Kristen, and as as i actually met her through the moth she told a moth story and i was talking with her after the event and she just Briefly in that story mentioned the fact that she had to learn to play piano. I was like, aha, like mm. this is this is a story that's related to this idea that I've had. And I was wondering like, would I be able to make this story work as an idea story, or is this just gonna be her story of how she learned to play the, an, an instrument for this role in the Broadway version of, of Once? And I mean, that was one of the the interview I, I went in and and she being somebody who performs just like talks and stories and uh and at the end of the interview i knew i had enough there to just follow basically her narrative track through and uh it was the first strictly narrative piece that i'd done in probably a year and a half mm. and and i like that variety i like being able to do that and then go back and do a piece on um cabaret license laws in in new york city like I, I like being able to bounce around it in that way, right? Which is a heavily reported, uh, almost historical piece. I mean, you're really going back, you're digging up the history, and and it's 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 they're they're all different kinds of pieces that you have, uh, and and you 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 have your first season, which is four episodes, and you have your second season, which is ten. And and I remember Alex somewhere either this was something you said in in one of the mini episodes or. Or I read it somewhere, but but you you refer to your first season as your EP, uh, and, and do you remember? I think that's actually Whitney. Is Whit it? I, I can't take credit for that. Oh no! Did All the good ideas from Pitch are from Whitney. Uh, well, yeah, I know that's that. Not true. Yeah. Was it was it you? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, part of it is just like how far can we take the metaphor? Well, of, uh, yeah, of yeah. <laughs> music, and, and so I was like, for uh, that's about the size of an EP, or. And, and so the next one was 10, and I'm like, yeah, that's about the size of an album. When we started releasing episodes, when we, we, we've we uh, reposted some episodes to our feed, and I was like, well, <laughs> should we just make that like a re-release or like a, a reissue? Like what? And, and so it, it's sort of just a, I don't know, just carrying the metaphor further. Right. I don't know that it really means much, but it, it's fun to tinker with. Right, and you have the encores in between episodes yeah, yeah. where you, you release. That, that actually got confusing at one point because people were like, oh, is this just a replaying of like, the I, I actually want to do a story about this at some point, like about it, how people thought. Our no, 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 an additional mini story or additional mini set to the, mm. the thing we did the week before. So I and and I bring it up be, because it's confusing though to people, which is maybe <laughs> not the best thing. But. I bring it up because it, it again to really pull this metaphor out now. Let's go for it. Uh, let's do it. Uh, you know, a, a musician or band's um, style or or their aesthetic will evolve from EP to first album to second album. How how do you see your style and aesthetic? Evolving from that first 
set of, of episodes or EP to your second season, which is your first album. It, w was there an, it, you know, was there an intentional shift? Did you sit down and you said, we want to do this, this, and this this season. We want to become more like this? Yeah, yeah. We, uh, we ha definitely had a discussion where we were like, we sound like Robert and Jad, but worse. Like a bad, a really <laughs> yeah. bad Robert and Jad. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so we decided, I don't know, I'd been listening a lot to TLDR at the time, which mm -hmm. is now Reply All, mm -hmm. which is a phenomenal show. Mm -hmm. um, and... They are definitely co-hosts, um, but they're not both on every episode. Like sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. It's just like Whitney was saying earlier. Like it just, it just sometimes makes sense for them both to be on, and sometimes it doesn't, and it's just no big deal. Um, and so that was a conversation that we had as well. Um, in terms of aesthetic, also uh, it's important. We didn't really know each other during the first season right. at all, and so we were trying to do this banter back and forth, and like. Literally in the first episode when we we're bantering back and forth. That's like the first time we'd ever been on microphone together And it was maybe like the fifth time we'd ever met and yeah, so the, like, the first time the, that that beer that we got at Milady's was the first time We talked for more than five minutes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and so like and we decided to make a show yeah, right then. Yeah. yeah The second season we're We don't go back and forth like it's it's individually hosted um, But we uh, we sort of got more comfortable working with each other and I, I think the, I think that reflects in, in, in what's, what's in the episodes. And I'm actually really excited to see how adding Rachel and Alan and, and us becoming closer as, as producers and friends, uh, I'm interested in seeing how that affects season three. I think it's going to definitely, definitely be for the better. Are there, are there lessons that you've learned in, in the first two seasons that, that really stick out to you is, is something you can share with us about your production, about the kinds of stories you have been looking at want to look at the mistakes you've made yeah, go ahead. I, I think I think the big lesson from I, I would say two things one if you ask people for interviews most of the time they'll say yes and sometimes they'll say no and, it, and then you move on from that but most of the time people will have, have been really cool about like saying sure I'll talk to you for an hour um, and the second lesson just went away I don't know what it is uh, well, it's, it's weird for me because I started producing this without knowing at all. I didn't know any, anything about how to do this. Like, right. the, you know, the first piece I ever produced was the first piece for Pitch, or, mm. or my, you know, episode number two for Pitch. Mm. And so I learned everything. Um, in terms of, like, start, just, I guess, general advice, like, I think the biggest thing I learned was that, like, having a collaborator who's really good at what he does, really great at everything. Uh, like, I mean, Whitney is like, I mean, first of all, having a collaborator, somebody to just hold you accountable and do something with you, like that's really, really important. Mm. But then also like having someone who's much better than you and you can learn from with every experience and will go back when he doesn't, at like five in the morning, the day before, you know, the day of the episode release and we'll just go through the session five minutes, seven minutes back to pull out this awkward thing you never thought to do that would define the show for the rest of his existence. Like, find someone like that if you can. Also, our, our skills are, um, are complementary. Like, there's things that Alex does that, like, Alex is a phenomenal interviewer, and I am not. Uh, Alex is... That's, that's not true. Uh, it, you're, you're wrong, but... Uh, <laughs> I, 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 our our skill set, I, I think... Um, yeah, I, we have complementary skills, which which works well together. We do different things, and uh, and, and I think bringing those two skill sets together uh, is really beneficial. So, I have to ask: uh, we we've all been anxiously awaiting the the elusive third season of Pitch. Is is there anything you can give us an off the cuff proof of concept teaser trailer of <laughs> of maybe what we can expect, the kind of stories that you'll be telling, the, the, the shifting points of view. Anything, please, we're desperate here. I wish that we could just like, kind of like pull down like, uh, like a screen and then like have a PowerPoint presentation. Like <laughs> someone walks out in like a black tank top. Um, and then suddenly it's all the episodes are on your phone and you can't do anything <laughs> to get rid of them. <laughs> yeah, um, we're not gonna do that. 
Uh, yeah, I, yeah. But uh, um, I think they will. Episodes will start coming out within the next few months, for sure. Um, we've it's been like I mean, yeah, I, 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 and I don't think it'll sound very different from kind of how things have been sounded, you know, have, have been sounding less, uh, or rather, less last season. Um, just, it, I think everything will be better, like, we'll just be the, the best version of ourselves, I think, this season, with just, I mean, we've just been, like, working really hard at uh, uh, figuring out who we are. Like, the, we, like, the time that we've spent right now has, or over the past few months has been just, like, really self-reflective and, like, trying to pull out who exactly we are so that when we go out uh, and start producing stories, we know without a doubt like where we're coming from and what we want to be doing. Um, and and as we are, as we've started producing the stories for season three, like that's been really really evident. I think. And I think the the same enthusiasm that we had for stories in the first and second season, like we we definitely still have that, and like it's it's just different topics that we're going after. And I think the to the degree that the first two seasons have been successful. It's given us confidence to to like to go bigger and to try new things and to have more fun with it, and uh, and I think that'll be reflected in in both story choice and uh, and and everything else in in the in the upcoming season. You know, it's funny. Like a lot of I hear a lot of like podcasters when they're interviewed talk about like how when no one's listening, like Jad always talks about, and Ellen Horn I heard on tape recently. Mm. Uh, uh, she was talking about how, like, when no one was listening to Radio Lab, like, they loved that because they were able to experiment and do whatever they want. Mm. And I kind of feel like the reverse, where like when no one was listening to us, like, we still didn't really know what exactly we were doing. And and I feel like the stakes were higher to be like, we know what we're doing, and so like, play it safe. And now that I think we have, n- now that we're further along, like, I feel like we have more of an obligation to be experimental and to push the boundaries. Mm. So I want to open it up to some questions from the uh, from the crowd. Oh, do we have a? <laughs> one of the things that one of the things that really strikes me about um, the episodes that I've heard is the length is an interesting choice of length because you're not limited um, by some commercial constraint or by some limited amount of space on a newspaper page, you have to consciously decide we are going to make a podcast that is going to be around 12 minutes long per episode, 13 minutes. For, you know, I'm sure some of them are a little shorter, a little longer, but that's pretty much the format. And that's a pretty short format. You're, you're, you're dealing with topics that you could go on and on, uh, for, you know, this entire interview session. If you had been like, this has to be 12 minutes long rather than two hours long, uh, there's a lot that has to be left on the cutting room floor. Uh, so within the, the pretty strict you know, guidelines that you've given yourself, there must have been many times in which really choice bits had to just be left behind because of your self-imposed length limits. Uh, I wonder, well, maybe it's a two-part question, but, like, how you decided on that length, and two, like, maybe you can give me an example of one particularly heartbreaking, really cool bit that, for the sake of prioritizing the short length, you felt like you have to just prioritize, you know, the, 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 you know that condensed thing over including this other bit, even though that other bit is really neat. Sure. Thank you, my cousin Jeffrey Lewis from the family section over there. I appreciate you kicking the Q and A session off. Um, uh, to, for, so for the first question, it, 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 there was never a discussion about like we wanted it short, twelve to thirteen minutes. Uh, uh, and there's no real length limit. Like we could we could produce you know an hour long episode. The thing is, you know, when you have you know two weeks or a month to produce a story, and you have a full time job. And the stories we produce are are, are very production heavy reported pieces. Um, you could go on forever and ever and ever about it, but I mean, it would it takes you know a long time and a lot of manpower to do that. 
Um, so I, I don't think we're re necessarily restricting ourselves. All right, we're, I know we're not restricting ourselves. Also, when, when you come from doing four and a half minute segments um, that fit like the, the broadcast clock, 12 minutes seems like an eternity. And after about eight and a half minutes, I'm like, shut up, Whitney. Like, why are you still talking? <laughs> and like after, after about that eight and a half minute point, I really feel like I have to justify every additional minute that, that we put into it. And, um, and sometimes we have an episode that's like 17 minutes and maybe I should have cut a minute from it. Sometimes they're nine and a half, 10 minutes. And it's sort of just like, am, am I getting bored at any point in the story? And if so, like we should probably cut it down a bit more. And then so for the second part of the question, uh, there's a, a term in radio called drowning the puppy, which is when you take this really precious deer thing that you have and for whatever reason, you kill it. You, you cut it. Um, and for us, I don't think it necessarily has to do with length. Um, it would have to do with like, you know, we, we could kill a puppy that's, you know, like just, a, I don't know, a really beautiful quote from someone that just does not fit at all with the story. Like, or, or the story is just, just uh, leaner and better when you cut it out. And that, that's what our encores are for. Right. Like we, we have these encores that are basically clips that like we love, but just didn't fit anywhere in, in the story. There, there's one from the uh, Please No Dancing episode about the cabaret license laws, uh, where I'm interviewing this, this emeritus professor, uh, this, this NYU law professor, and he talks about, he, he, from his voice you can, you can tell that he's an older man, and he talks about going to this goth club. And it's like this, it's one of my favorite moments of tape from the entire second season, but it's not in any of our episodes. And so I'm like, that has to go in the encore. Is it, yeah, that was in the it. encore, right? Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Hi. Um, was it a conscious decision for you to not seek sponsorship? And if so, why? Or, and are you seeking it in the future? Um, it was conscious in the sense that at the outset, uh, so there's like essentially like a certain number you have to hit in order for sponsorship to really be worth it without going into too many details about why that is and how it works. Um, and we, we were just talking about this before we were having dinner before, we were having an early dinner before this show, and we were talking about how the first episode we released the first day, what were the numbers? 17 first, first 24 downloads. hours, there were 14 downloads of our first episode. And like that, the, nobody wants to advertise to 14 people. <laughs> right. Um, but we're not categorically rejecting sponsorship. Um, and if you work for a corporation that's looking to sponsor, <laughs> you can see me after the show. Had you done had you done any marketing of the show, advertising of the show, but other than the media coverage that you got, have you made any? Well, we, well, so a lot of the media coverage that we got actually was our own reaching out to people. Like I was in a band for a really long time, um, uh, and when you're in, in a, like a, a small indie band, like you can't afford to hire PR, and there's a bajillion other small indie mm -hmm. bands vying to get people's attention. So you just have to just kind of email as many people as you can and just hope for hits. And um, I kind of tried to take a page out of being a small indie band uh, when uh, we were premiering season two. Like I emailed uh, you know a bunch of uh, reporters, people who I knew that covered podcasts or. Uh, uh, you know, whatever. Um, and then even with the, the first episode, you know, a lot of times what, what bands do is they get exclusive premieres on websites. So they get a website, you know, they get Stereo Gum to premiere their first single off the album. Uh, and it comes out a little bit early and, you know, you get the cross promotion from, you know, having Stereo Gum, uh, you know, whatever, you know, you present it and then Stereo Gum gets like this great content that they can say that, you know, they had the indie band first or whatever. And so I thought to do that with the, uh, with the premiere of season two. And so I reached out to a few places, and Whitney Matheson, who now covers podcasts for, uh, what's that, Brain Pickings? Mental Floss. Mental floss. Uh, uh, and uh, she was at USA Today at the time. And they killed her column like the next week, and right. I want to publicly apologize to Whitney <laughs> Matheson. But uh, it was a great column, and like, uh, USA Today. But... Um, 
Yeah. Yeah. So, so just to that point, like a lot of it was actually us reaching out to people, um, which is another reason why a lot of podcasts, I think, aren't sponsored and why one of the reasons why we're not sponsored is because like you have to reach out to people and be proactive and sometimes you only have enough to, you know, enough to uh, just produce the damn thing. You don't want to do the rest. So um, I'm curious, I'm going to frame this in the context of how I listen to podcasts in general, but also pitch. Um, it's on an iPod, and it's when I'm walking around, it's when I'm going to work. And one of the things I'd be curious to hear your thoughts around are um, the particular intimacy of knowing that your audience is listening to you just them. Uh, you know, the, the experience of having your voice in their ears. Um, and I wonder if that ever influences the way that you think about speaking um, on the show. I, I hadn't heard that. I, I guess I assumed everybody got together and had like big group <laughs> gatherings and listened to pitch that way. But um, <laughs> uh, for, the, for the first little while, I mean, nobody, not nobody, but like through our first season, through our first four episodes, we had like a couple hundred downloads at most. And so it was real easy because like nobody was really listening. <laughs> and so like I, I didn't really think about the audience in, in the first couple episodes we did. It was just like this is a fun thing and I'm going to voice it like I'm talking to Alex because he's just sitting here in the room with me. Um, the second season, it, it did take on a bit of a different feel um, knowing that like there were people listening to it. And like you said, it's like there it's just basically you as the producer or, or narrator and the person walking around or in the subway or whatever. And I, I don't know that it really changed anything we were doing production wise, uh, but it's, it's helpful to think about as you're actually voicing. Um, you're, you're obviously, if, if we're in a room like this and there are, it's a group of people, I'm, gonna, I'm going to talk and I'm gonna project differently than if I'm just sitting down like earlier tonight, if, if, I'm, if I'm eating dinner with Alex across the table, I'm not gonna talk this loud. Like, there's just a difference in tone, there's a difference in uh, enunciation, I, all those little things come into play. Yeah, and, and, and uh, Roman Mars, I think, has talked about how he voices, like he, he you know, I, I, and I'm conflating this with something else that Joe, I saw, saw Joe Richmond talk on a panel as well uh, from Radio Diaries, um, and he was talking about how you know, when you wear earbuds, like, like the, the person is literally inside of your ears. That's where the sound is coming from. So, you know, you can, you don't have to mic yourself back here. You can mic yourself right here and talk very softly and it'll be totally different. And actually when in the piece that, uh, the first piece that Alex played, um, I had like a really bad sinus infection at that point and I couldn't possibly speak louder than that. Um, but because people are listening on earbuds, um, it actually sounded okay, I think. Hey, I have uh, three different questions I could ask you. Um, pick a number, one to three. Two. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, so we were talking. Uh, you were talking about um, like what makes an awesome interviewer. Before, um, I'm wondering if this is actually a question that all three of you can chime in on. Um, what do you think makes for a good interview in print journalism versus podcast interviews? Well, I've never done print journalism, so I might yeah. not be the person to answer. So that's where Alex comes in. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's you, that's what, you what, Alex. Well, what Alex is like, <laughs> What is it like um, doing a print interview? Do you record them? Uh, it depends. Sometimes I do if it's going to be a long interview. If I'm, if I'm interviewing someone for a specific piece of information, then probably not. If I'm interviewing someone on background or, 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 or to get their background or to, to piece together a longer story, then, then yes, I will record them. Uh, but, but again, not worrying about things like micing them the right way. And, and do, you do, like do you just call them up and do it over the phone or do you actually go out into the world and it depends. Meet them? I mean, you, uh, Best case, you're going to meet them. You want to be with a person. Mm -hmm. You want to see how they act, how they move, their facial expressions. There's a lot more you can read about a person when you're in person. Um, 
it, but jet, just schedule wise, phone tends to be the best. Uh, but in terms of the content of the interview in an audio interview versus a interview for print, um, I, I think that in, 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 in print you, uh, it, it, there's a lot more that you can, you can kind of work in with print in terms of you can paraphrase things that people say, you, you, can, you can cut quotes in a certain way that maybe you couldn't do in audio. I don't know how much paraphrasing of, of people's inner things that they say do you guys do versus using their clips. What do you mean? Well, I mean, we clearly can't paraphrase that. I just build an alphabet of sounds and just <laughs> construct the words. However what I, like. I mean is, is, is you're, you're, you're saying what they said in a yeah. cleaner way. Uh, Narr Narration-wise, yeah, for yeah. sure, we do that all the time. If it takes them a minute and a half to say something that should be covered in a sentence, you just edit out the person and say what essentially they said. Some and some a lot of shows like take a lot of liberties liberties with that, mm -hmm. uh, and that's a whole moral thing that I don't really mind. But um, I, I I think it, uh, uh, the similarity between the two is your your you're using quotes or you're using clips of people to, to show who they are, right? You, you know, they, they need to be the most descriptive. You don't need to have them telling you, you know, how, how a piece of machinery, machine, excuse me, machinery works unless it is saying something about their character or placing you in a scene, right? That's very yeah. effective in audio. If you have someone walking through in a, you know, an auto factory explaining how machine works, that not only gives you just ex, uh, uh, exposition, but it gives you setting as well. Yeah. Well, I was just gonna say uh, one thing that, that popped up when you were talking about uh, um, doing stuff for print is that I, essentially the, the main thing that I try to go for is like emotional tape, like I want them to emote something so like so you know which which doesn't necessarily get expressed in print when you just read the words like what he was saying before when he was looking at the transcript with Jen Lena the the professor at, at Columbia mm -hmm. in defense uh, of print good print can do that for sure <laughs> yeah of course and that's what good print should do but fair yeah um, and then I had another thing I was gonna say that I forgot that's okay yeah. do you want to ask another one of your questions Really? Okay. Um, pick one or three Am I in on this one as well, or it's just them? You too? should pick this one. It, it doesn't matter. Oh well. Uh, Three. Okay. Um, okay, these are for uh, uh, Alex Kappelman and Whitney. Um, so, when do you know you've got a solid piece? Like you just know it's done. I've got it. This is it. When when you have the piece, or, or when do you know it's done? Because um, those are two different things. Hmm. You can speak to both if they're two different things. Um, usually during, uh, y when I have the piece, I, th I think for me it's typically at some point during the interviewing process. Um, usually I'm talking to somebody for the story and there's a moment where they say something and it's just like, okay, if everything else fails on this the rest of the way, I can build enough around that thing they just said and what I already have. Like I, I can build a story out of that. Like I've got it there. When a story is done is basically when it's four in the morning the day of and you're just like i gotta bring this thing to an end yeah like i threw the one of the biggest things i've learned since becoming a radio producer is that I, I used to just hate deadlines and now i love deadlines because otherwise i would just tinker and tinker and change things uh and maybe it would be better maybe it wouldn't be better um but like unless there's a deadline motivating me to do something like it'll it'll never be done um I'll, I'll just try to make it as perfect as it possibly can be, and it's never going to be perfect, obviously. Um, so it's done when I have to send it to Whitney so we can put it up on the RSS feed. And, and by, by the point, by the time we've gotten to that point, we've put in a lot of hours into these things, and it's probably healthy to step away from them anyway, and to have like I, I typically think a piece of mine is done, and then I'll send it to Alex, and it'll be like, it's good. Drop this piece. And uh, this little music bed over here, the volume needs to go up a little bit. And so, like those last little fixes are usually when I'm like, okay, I, I've been I've been doing this nonstop for the last three days. Alex has heard it; 
he thinks it's good enough to go out with these two fixes. I'll make those two fixes, and then that's a stopping point for it. Good question in back. I've noticed that you've talked about a lot of your influences and the age of these people is a lot older than you guys, as are a lot of the people that you interview on your show. So I'm wondering if age is a factor that you guys see being either a problem or a facilitating factor, et cetera, et cetera. And question number two, if you have time, is have you, I know you talked about video briefly, have you thought about incorporating either video or live performance uh, in your show? Um, so for question one with age, it, I think we, Whitney and I value diversity a lot and we talk a lot about like uh, gender uh, and you know, orientation and uh, ethnicity and uh, I, I, honestly age has never been something that I really thought about until you just asked me and I'm sure that uh, that, that shapes the way we say stories or, or we make stories and uh, we, we, it would be great to get different perspectives uh, from age as well. I don't know if, do you think about that at all? I don't know, you're, uh, you're old, Whitney. Yeah, I'm old. I, I, people typically think I'm about six years younger than I am. Uh, age. <laughs> age. Yeah, I, I'm trying to think, like, I, I think we had, I'm thinking back, and we do have a good variety of ages, like, certainly there are people in our stories that are older, but we have, we have people in, in, in people's we have people in their uh, 20s and 30s. Um, piano player episode, the dance episode. Um, karaoke. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I feel like, I know I'm, I'm thinking back through the people I've interviewed and some of the stories in, in the first couple of seasons have been uh, sort of focused on items in music that were, things that were happening in music like in the 80s and 90s and just by virtue of them being in of that sort of cultural time period the people in the stories are going to be older um i mean i would i was a around then but like a six-year-old whitney jones isn't going to have much to say about what was happening in the late 80s um yeah Although we did have, we had, we've had a, a wide range of ages. Yeah. And we've had kids, yeah, like, we were, like, six or eight That's or something true. like that. Yeah. And we had, uh, how old was that, uh, was he an attorney? Or the, the old guy who went to the cop club? Yeah, he was, he was older. Yeah, he was old, he yeah. was older. Um, as far as uh, video and live shows and all that, like, these are things we're thinking about. We want to be everywhere all the time, essentially, yeah. All right, well, if there aren't any more questions, I think it's time for another beer. And uh, thank you two so much for, for coming tonight and, and sharing all that you've shared. And there will be video and audio very, very soon. And thank you all for coming. And uh, please enjoy some drinks and food and have a good night. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Thanks Rob. Thanks, everybody.